There's seats up front. There's one or two there. There's one or two there. Very quiet. Is that a thumbs up? I'm just going to let people come in and sit. There's seats. If you want their seats up front. Oh, put their seats over here. <laughs> There's a couple up here, guys. One there and one there, I see. Cool. That's right. Yeah, I'm out. <coughs> are you here until are you still a couple more days? Or are you? Mm -hmm. Tomorrow morning. Yeah, I'm safe. Right. I think there's one over here. Hi, everybody. Welcome. I think everybody's got a seat. You can tell you have a bossy moderator when I'm queuing people to the empty seats in the front row. Um, uh, I'm Will Obey, and welcome to um, social media and the new social contract. Um, you know, I'm a regular here at this conference, and I often find that it functions as a snapshot of sorts. It captures not just the issues and topics of the, of the day, but also the mood. And John Steinberg um, of Cheddar on the end and I were here last year at last year's social media panel, and it was about um, fake news. And we covered issues of politics and the erosion of truth. And flash forward to a year from then, here we sit. And I don't know about you, but it feels like a very different time. Um, fake news almost seemed like a kinder, gentler era <laughs> in social media, right? That was before we really understood uh, the role bots play in the social media ecosystem, before Cambridge Analytica and the harvesting of the data of 87 million users, and before Mark Zuckerberg was um, invited or hauled uh, before Congress. Uh, so again, to me, this moment feels different. And I'd like to start by asking this panel the same question. So is it um, just a great big Facebook problem? Is it a tech lash or a tech backlash? Um, you know, the next phase of the digital revolution? Or is it a moment of cultural reckoning or something else? So I have um, John, uh, John Steinberg from Cheddar. Um, Malik, Chris Hughes, and Tristan Harris. And Chris, I think I'm going to start with you because you say that you think it took the Cambridge Analytica scandal to really educate users, to really open that door to what was really going on. And I think it's only beginning. I hope it's only beginning. I think, um, you know, we all know the, the, um, the state of play, if you will, after the Cambridge, Cambridge Analytica scandal, 87 million. Facebook users' data was exposed um, and, in many cases, in, uh, used against them in political advertising. And all of a sudden, people are starting to ask fundamental questions. How much data do I create? Do I own it? Does Facebook own it? If, I'm, if it's my photo, is that mine to keep? If Tristan takes a photo of me and I'm in it, is that, is that mine? Can I take it with me to go to other platforms? And I think importantly, where else can I go if I wanted to? Is, is there real competition in this, in this space and in this world? So um, I think we're, I, I do think that this is a watershed moment. I think it's a cultural reckoning. I hope that it's just the beginning of it because um, now that we're on the other side of Mark's testimony in, uh, in front of Congress a couple weeks ago, I think that there's, at least in Silicon, Silicon Valley or amongst tech folks, sort of a collective exhale. 
we got we got we got through this phase, and I think that that is um, uh, profoundly misplaced. I think that instead, true leadership in this moment would view this as an opportunity to have a big cultural conversation about all this data, about who owns it, about what's happening with it, and even bigger questions about what role government should play, and I think whether or not we as the users of these platforms should be compensated or have some share of the wealth that these platforms create. So it is a watershed moment, but it, 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 it's, it's, it's an it should be seen as an opportunity, I think. Uh, and hold all those thoughts, because we will be getting into um, any number of those. So I Tristan, so. Um, a little over a year ago, you appeared on 60 Minutes and uh, really alerted uh, in, in a very national and visible way us to the behavioral modification machines yeah. um, that are both the tools and the media we consume on them. Are you, first of all, briefly share what you said, and then are you amazed at the reaction since then? Yeah, um, well, is that, um, is that okay? Here, let me move this over here. Um, so, uh, yeah, so about a year ago, I was on 60 Minutes. Uh, my background, by the way, I was a Google design ethicist, which meant I was trying to studying, um, if you have a two billion person ant colony called humanity, and then you put a phone in their pocket, how does it manipulate all their psychological biases and get them to do things? And um, so the question is really, how do you ethically manipulate two billion people's thoughts? And so back in 2013, um, I created a presentation at Google about how we have a moral responsibility in shaping two billion people's attention and their choices and then which relationships they attend to or not. Um, because basically, to your point, um, what people I think are waking up to is that technology is increasingly the number one political, social, electoral, cultural actor in the world. Um, the more people have a phone in their pocket just to sort of set the table stakes, there's two billion people who use Facebook. Uh, that's about the number of followers of Christianity. There's 1.5 billion people who use YouTube. That's about the number of followers of Islam. People, millennials, check their phones 150 times a day from the moment you wake up in the morning and turn your alarm off to the moment you go to bed and you turn your alarm on. So we've got you really jacked in from the moment you wake up, check your phone, thoughts start streaming into your head that you're not controlling. And the designers of the technology companies really do control what people are thinking. Um, and so that question becomes, you know, how do you wake people up to that? And so 60 Minutes a year ago was, was at the very least, sort of opening up the conversation about addiction and how people's minds are influenced in ways that they don't see. And I think things like Cambridge Analytica and the Russian bots um, you know, are, are awakening people to the fact that you can sway. It's like a remote control for manipulating an election. You know, and Hitler needed a radio in every home. Now Putin just needs you know, Facebook in every person's hand. And I think that we have a business model, the thing I hope we talk about later, is we have this business model that basically makes this business as usual. The business model is what enables this problem, and I hope we talk more about that later. So um, as a, a tech insider, both as somebody who covers technology and invests in uh, technology, how would you characterize this moment? I think uh, we are in between uh, the past and the future. Mm -hmm. uh, we are, you know, for the longest time, we've been controlled by the rules and ideas and ideologies of the industrial era, where the world moved at a more human scale, and now we are going into a world which moves at the speed of the network, where our thoughts are manipulated at the speed of the network. So as human beings, we are finding ourselves very unsettled, that we don't know what we are doing, mm -hmm. and so I think we are caught between the, the past and the future. The future will, technology, the one, the technology which has created problems, will also come up with solutions to how to manage our future. Uh, you know, the, what Facebook is, is the most efficient form of a network effect. It's the most efficient form of behavior modification. It is the genetically modified tobacco of social media, right? It has done a great job of what it was started to do, which is build, no, not in 2004, but post-2008, to be the most efficient advertising platform on the history of humankind. They have done a great job of that. And you can see that in the stock price. You can mm -hmm. see that in their earnings. They, the system is working as it was supposed to do, uh, supposed to work. And I think there is nothing you know, crazy about that from, from a technology standpoint. From a social and cultural standpoint, 
suddenly in last six months people have actually woken up to the idea that well this is not good for us and I don't think people still quite grasp how bad it is for us mm -hmm. they just realize it's not good for us right so, so John yeah. so through the lens of you're in the digital media business but you really um, and you cover business right Facebook second biggest seller of digital ads um, no signs of that diminishing anyway is it is it still business as usual in the business and advertising community or are they begin beginning to come to terms with this you as know, a moment of reckoning you know Will, I, I got it wrong when um, the Cambridge Analytica thing came out I thought that not that the advertisers would care about that so much but what Facebook did almost immediately afterwards was they made the product less effective they clamped down on a lot of tools. You could no longer use credit card data, third-party data to be able to target people. Um, they took away tools that we use that allowed us to see which content, which advertising content was being seen by people after the fact. They made the product less effective. Um, they closed a lot of loopholes. And I thought to myself, oh, this is going to be bad. Facebook's product is, is still going to be the best advertising product, but it's going to be 10% less good. What I didn't realize was their product is so much better than everybody else's product and they have you know the two billion people on it and they have those two billion people coming back daily if not if not weekly um, so there was no impact then the marketers there is a cluster of very high profile CMOs in the United States that work for fortune 500 companies they they want good PR they, they want to be viewed as caring about things that matter in society but ultimately they care more about selling their products right so you will continually see these veiled threats by, by these uh, marketing giants. We're going to pull our ads from YouTube. We're going to stop doing advertising with Facebook. If Facebook doesn't fix this, they're going to have big problems with our marketing budget. But it is all um, spin because they, they can't, they, it's impossible for a company in the United States to not market on Facebook. Mm -hmm. And so next quarter, when we get results next quarter, which would reflect this current period yeah. of time, well, we just had the Facebook quarter, which, which yeah, had some of it, to your point. It's like a, a stub period of it. Um, th they'll, they'll continue to be better and better. Yeah, 42% year-over-year year growth in their earnings. I mean, you can't go wrong with that, right? I think, basically, Facebook, uh, the CMOs of big companies like Procter & Gamble need Facebook and Google, not the other way around. I think that this is a fallacy to think that the big companies uh, like the Facebook needs the big big consumer brands they don't they can make small brands big almost overnight we've seen that happen they've created enough wealth whether it is Zynga whether it is Spotify you see they are the real kingmakers so I think if you're you know like Lever or PNG you are actually more beholden to Facebook than you realize and and Google I mean I'm not saying that it's just one mm -hmm. So right, so is this just a Facebook problem or more? No, it's, this is just across the board social media problem. It's across the board digital media problem. And I think anyone who says that it's just a Facebook problem, they should see the scripts running on their own websites. All the newspapers are such you know, hypocrites. Like New York Times has 21 tracking scripts running on their on their you know website so if they were holier than thou they mm -hmm. wouldn't be running all those things. By the way whatever happened to Ghostery? Do you remember Ghostery? It, it's still around. It's still around? Yeah. Do people still use it? I highly recommend it. It's yeah. an, you you sign up for it and it shows you who's tracking you on whatever site that you're on um, and it's a little horrifying um, when, you, but when you see that on your feed. Just to be clear the, the traditional media is not very good at it like Facebook and Google are very good at being advertising platform. The old media guys, and which I mean all the online publications, they're just not as good as the, the two of them. As good as at what at, exactly? Like targeting, selling ads, being more effective, getting more money per ad out of their, their customers, which are the advertisers. The big media companies are just like, you know, they're still stuck in the past. These guys have already yeah, moved but on. I, I'll take the other side of it. I, I do think it's just a, a Facebook problem. And not that I really disagree with anything that Ohm is saying, but the executives at Facebook, the people at Facebook, are so much more arrogant um, than any other company that I deal with. And I have found that when you sense the tenor of the people at the companies, you've got a good indication of what's going on um, at the companies, right? 
and you know there it's it, it it is so clear that that it's all just it all is spin they you know even even after the testimony and even after the Cambridge Analytica thing on all of their internal messaging boards as reported by the New York Times you know they were basically saying this is so unfair and why is everybody coming after us and and all of these things so um, I think that lack of you know receptiveness um, makes them far more dangerous than anyone else. So Chris, you re you we should point out you are co-founder of Facebook. You have not worked there in a very long time, but you also referenced this. I think that's what you were getting at when you talked about the collective exhale. Mm. Um, do you agree with John? I well, I think the problem uh, is much bigger than Facebook, but I also agree with John that there is. Um, uh, a culture at Facebook, at Google, I would say at the biggest companies that is um, really a result of the concentration of power that they have. I mean, the fact that there, that if what both John and Omer are saying is true, that Procter and Gamble and other huge consumer goods companies don't have anywhere else to go. I mean, I think that should make anybody who believes in the free market and the virtue of competition very uncomfortable. I mean, that's essentially saying that so much power has been concentrated at Facebook and Google that the biggest, most talented advertisers and marketers have, have next to no leverage. And I think that, 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 should, that, that should be cause for concern for anybody who cares about that competition. I do, though, think that we need to be very specific about what problems we're talking about. And I put the okay. problems in three buckets. The first is data privacy and protection. That's the Cambridge Analytica uh, scandal, and that's the question around who owns my data? Is it my property? Is it my labor? How should we think about it? The second category, for me at least, is around democracy and the news. How do we make sure that we don't build networks that only reward the most extreme voices, like Donald Trump, let alone make sure that, uh, that the, the uh, you know, foreign powers aren't able to hack the elections. And then there's the third, which is um, much of what Tristan was talking about at the top of the conversation around attention and the way that these, these, these companies, through our apps and through our devices, very much decide where to, uh, where to direct our attention and uh, increasingly own more and more of it. So these problems are each so big, it's hard to talk about all of them mm -hmm. because they've just been boiling under the surface for 15 plus years now, and now they're all spilling out at once. And I think that that's, that's why I think it's such a, a, a critical and pivotal moment to dig into each. So let's talk a little bit about what the social contract in, in the digital age, in the age of mobile and social looks like. And Tristan, I wonder if you could share with us a little bit some of your thinking about um, how we need to reorient or redefine that contract yeah. as one that's more of a fiduciary one. Yep. Well, <clears throat> I think partially, as Chris said, you know, Silicon Valley, all these products are merged out of very much a libertarian philosophy. We create a product. If people like it, they use it. If they don't like it, they won't. If you don't like your, face, your two billion person Facebook social network, just switch to another two billion person social network. Um, but of course, I just came back from the University of Chicago, classic Chicago School Antitrust uh, Conference, and even in their blind spot, I think the network effects that these companies have created have made it virtually impenetrable. And even as Ohm and, and John have mentioned, um, the traditional sources of who owns the dollars and can you redirect them and do some shareholder activism or uh, customer activism, even the, the customers, the advertisers, the true customers can't really do that much. And so there's this question of what relationship really are we in with these platforms? Because um, right now, it's just sign on the dotted line, hit consent, and now they can change their policies at any moment in the future. And they theoretically kind of notify you, but then they don't. Uh, and they can do whatever they want. And they can choose new business models, and they can adopt. And that just basically allows them this free pass to do whatever they want. And you, the user, are responsible because you hit the OK button. So what I would love to introduce to you is um, there, there's, there's a name for a different, there's a different kind of relationship that we need to have for these products. Um, and it's a fiduciary one. So if you think about the asymmetric power that an attorney has over its client, you know, it knows way more about the law, can totally manipulate and exploit its customer, the client, and it has lots of privileged information from its client. And so if it wanted to, we could just screw over that person because the level of asymmetric power is just enormous. 
Same thing with the psychotherapist, you know, and, and their client. Same thing with like a, you know, a priest in a, in a confession box. So if you, if you stack those up, how much asymmetric power does an attorney have of, over the client? How much asymmetric power does a psychotherapist have over the intimate details and private thoughts of the person they're serving? Now add right next to that, side by side, how much power about the intimate details of your mind and your communication and even about how your own brain works that you don't know about how your brain works does Facebook have? On the, on the grounds of that asymmetric power alone, um, we should reclass Facebook as having a fiduciary responsibility or a fiduciary relationship. And it instantly adds this other thing, which is it instantly makes clear why Facebook could never be an advertising-based business model. Because imagine um, a psychotherapist who knew every detail of your life and also listened to every one of your conversations with everyone else and everyone's conversations with each other and then its entire business model was to sell access to that information to someone else. It's like a priest in a confession booth whose entire business model, the only way they make money, is by selling access to everything they've learned in that confession booth to someone else. When you, you frame it that way... Did you see Westworld last night? I did not. No, don't say, no spoiler alert. This is like the plot. No, no, no. Okay, I, I have not seen it. it. Did anyone here see that last night? Why? Okay. <laughs> so, uh, I'm going to write I, a bad I'm, article about you. <laughs> That's it. And so I think this makes super clear, this is a dangerous business model. Um, the ability, so I, by the way, my background through the, this entire field is when I was a kid, I was a magician. And so I've always had this sensitivity to the fact that people's minds can be manipulated. Like that's like, instead of seeing choice as this authoritative thing that like there's a human being and they're walking through the world and they're choosing, I just see human beings inside of 24 seven magic tricks of cognitive biases that their mind's placing on them. And then when I was in college at Stanford, I was part of a lab called the Persuasive Technology Lab that basically teaches engineering students how do you manipulate people's psychology uh, to get them to be engaging with products. And my you know, friends in the class, best friends, were the founders of Instagram. Uh, and they taught basically, you know, if you want people to use a product more, you turn it into a slot machine. So you give them the juicy red dot rewards. And you give it sometimes. You give the 20 likes sometimes. And you hold some back the next time. And you give them 25 more likes, because that makes it addictive. So the human animal is very, very easily manipulable. And from that perspective, you have 2 billion human animals jacked into one environment where the business model is to manipulate all the deepest vulnerabilities of that animal, including, and I think the thing we don't talk about is that you add on top of all of this is AI, where basically there's something that Facebook actually, if you check it out, there's an article in The Intercept about FB learner flow, where basically um, Facebook can predict what you're going to be loyal to in the future and not loyal to. They can predict when you have low self-esteem. They can predict when you're about to change your opinions on certain topics. Because it's that psychotherapist who's not just listening to you and all your conversations, but two billion people's conversations. We've never had an AI that could basically learn from two billion people's minds, including what color buttons light up your mind. And so when you think about it that way, this is an incredibly dangerous situation to have all that power be completely unaccountable to the public interest, to democracy, to truth. And they can claim that they care about you know, users, but they only care about them only insofar as they're the sheep that they need to be jacked into the, the kind of matrix that they've created. Okay, now that you've terrified us, <laughs> I'm going to turn to Chris. Um, so, first of all, I noticed you smiling, and I didn't know, knew, know, couldn't tell whether you were smiling because in appreciation, in mm -hmm. disagreement, in so. Uh, feel free to share, but also you come at this from um, a slightly different sort of contractual perspective in the contract between us, our data, and companies who would have at it. Well, on the first point, I mean, I agree with everything that Tristan just said. I think his analysis, um, I mean, I give Tristan credit for seeing, seeing this world in the direction it's been heading in um, well before just about anybody else. So I was nodding, nodding in general agreement. I think that um, the key thing that really stands out to me, and um, I just think that we cannot, um, uh, uh, can't, can't overstate, is how much the design choices really matter and encourage people mm -hmm. into behaviors that, um, that may feel good in the short term, but often are an illusion for the long term. And so when it comes to data and ownership, this is what I'm thinking the most about these days, because this is where it is not just a Facebook or even a Google problem. I mean, your phones know exactly where you've been geographically at every single moment of the day. If you've got uh, one of those Nest thermostats that you know helps you be energy efficient, it knows exactly the temperature 
in your home, your Alexa is listening to everything that you're saying, not to mention that all your email on Google and, um, and elsewhere. The amount of data that we're creating is enormous. And in many cases, that's very good. You know, the big data analytics that comes with you know, um, the analysis of, of Tesla driving patterns means that cars in the future might be safer. However, the, the issue is that all these people are create all of us are creating all of this data, and Tristan's exactly right. We're just hitting agree at the beginning of the process, giving up on all legal rights, and then uh, effectively not getting any kind of compensation for that. And so what's actually happening is historic profits. I mean, the margins of businesses like Facebook and Google, too, last week's reporting record earnings, too, are through the roof. And the CEOs just say, oh, well, you get to use the service for free. When in reality, all of that data is not only valuable now, but it, with coming artificial intelligence, it's going to be even more valuable in the future. So that's why I think that more people should be talking about some, some kind of data dividend, some kind of sovereign wealth fund that is capitalized from companies that make enormous historic profits off of consumer data that then cuts a check. Maybe it's a 5% royalty or something like that on their revenues that goes into the fund that then cuts a check to each American to make sure that everybody shares in the upside of this a little bit. There's precedent for this up in Alaska with oil. Those of you, uh, many of you might know the permanent fund. Every single Alaskan gets a check paid for by something that was their common resource. Data, I think, is the common wealth that we're all creating of the future century, and we should tie our economic outcomes uh, to it so that it's not just a few people who are getting extremely, extremely um, lucky and extremely fortunate like myself and, uh, and many others in the tech world. So I have a much more approachable <laughs> target for all the big companies. Mm -hmm. And the way I think about the problem we have right now is very much like the tobacco problem. For the longest time, tobacco. Wait, I noticed you called it earlier genetically modified tobacco. Tobacco. Yeah. tobacco has been around forever, mm -hmm. and it wasn't as addictive uh, till like Philip Morrison, which is the other one. I used to smoke it. R.J. Reynolds? Camel. Okay. Yeah, R.J. Reynolds. They used to, they modified the tobacco and everything changed. So behavior modification in media has always been around. I just think Facebook took it to the next level. Uh, but what I was going to say is that in the tobacco industry, it's like a good parallel because they did exactly the same thing. It was causing more problems. Just to put that label on the, on the boxes was a big step forward. And I think we need to have similar approach to data and privacy. I say instead of terms of service, mm -hmm. all companies, big and small, should be forced to write terms of trust, what they will not do with our data rather than saying what they will do with their data. You know, that's pretty undefinable in technology terms, but you know, when you look at what Facebook failed to do is protect our data through by, you know, it leaked through, uh, through some third party app. That is their job as a platform. Mm -hmm. That is like policemen sleeping on the job and just like the company will come and steal everything. So that's where I feel that terms of trust is very important. Mm -hmm. And the other thing which I would say these guys need to do is like we need to figure out a non uh, you know industry group of uh, which regulates data. I don't think people from technology industry should be allowed to do this because we need actual people and their representatives actually coming up with the, with the rules and regulations around how data needs to be managed. So give me your three things you'd want to see in the terms of trust that the number one thing would be that it would not leak to a third mm -hmm. party, that they will protect mm -hmm. it. I mean, like, yeah. just like, how about that for starters? <laughs> like, you know, like, my data is not going to get robbed by people. That I would take that as number one, you know, and the number two would be just like, you know, they will not sell it to, you know, third parties. I, you know, right, Facebook is giving me value, and they want to make money off it. They cannot make money off by selling it to other people. When I say selling it means like what happened with Cambridge Analytica. They are selling it to advertisers. And I think at this point, we are kind of a little late from, from that perspective. You mean a little late to change the business yeah, model. Yeah, yeah. And also, you know, I, having been in technology for almost three decades, 
you know, there was a time when Microsoft looked unbeatable and Sun Microsystems looked unbeatable and, you know, they all come and they all go. I'm on the fifth generation of billionaires now. <laughs> so I'm assuming there is something out there, you know. So John, it's sort of interesting that um, big bad old media suddenly looks, you know, valorous in all of this. Yeah. But, but in all seriousness, is are there um, codes of ethics, codes of conduct yes. from the media business that would be applicable here? I'm so glad you asked this question because I, what I wanted to comment on was where I believe the social contract exists between media and the distributors of media. Imagine how bad the relationship with Facebook has gotten between the media that somebody like Andy Lack, who's hardly a, a, a bomb thrower, refers to Facebook as fake book in, in public panels now. The relationship has gotten to the point that it's so worthless um, that he could say something like that. That my old CEO, Jonah Peretti, you know, is now making um, you know, comments about Facebook not really living up to its bargain and compensating publishers. That Rupert Murdoch, well, I mean, I guess Murdoch says whatever he wants to say, but that he's doing now full page letters saying that they have to pay um, publishers money. If, if any, Facebook's a lot like Trump in that the first time Trump does something crazy, everyone is shocked. And then over time and over time, it becomes, it becomes normalized. And you know, Tristan can probably comment to this. The human being adapts to basically anything. If Comcast or Charter Cable was continually saying to media companies, you know, today you're here, and then tomorrow your channel disappears, and sorry, or the, the sorry. Um, and they continually move people around the dial, and then some days they got access to the audience data, and other days people would be uh, up in arms. It would be absolutely you know, intolerable. But what Facebook did was they changed it so often, and they were so distrustful to, uh, to the media companies that people just became you know, kind of accustomed to it. There was nothing that you could say anymore. Um, yeah, I mean, the only the only bright side to it is that you know you hear someone like Tim Cook, um, in his interview with Kara Swisher on, on MSNBC, you know, saying that you know we never would have gotten ourselves in a situation like this. Historically, Apple has always treated media companies far better. There's been a set of rules. The rules have been here. You've done a contract. You've been put on the system. You know, the, the, the App Store doesn't change radically overnight where your app just suddenly disappears and people can no longer download it. Um, and the traditional cable companies have typically behaved with much more negotiation and trust and agreement. When I look at our relationship now with Hulu and YouTube TV um, and Sling, we did a contract, we did a negotiation, we're on the system in a way. There are rules around what we put on the system. There are rules around um, how they compensate us and how the ad split works. There's, an act, there's not only a social contract, there's an actual contract in place. Um, so, you know, they, they have no friends left now. You know, they, they have no friends left. No one is rooting for their success. Um, every media company wants them to fail. And that's, you know, five, ten years of, of bad behavior. I think it's the same BuzzFeed people who are complaining about Facebook. Yeah, same. Two same years one. ago, they couldn't get enough. So, like, we cannot, I just, I have no sympathy for big media at all. This is a mess of their own making. They've shot themselves in the foot. I was the first person who went to my editors and said, we should start a website. And they said no. And then you know, they fired me, essentially. That's what happens. It's like with big media, let them rot to hell. That's OK. The problem <laughs> we are, we are going to talk about is Facebook. And I think Facebook, how do we think about Facebook in the next chapter mm -hmm. of Facebook? Yeah. I think that's more important. What has happened in the past, that's not going to change. Like, how are we going to control the beast? Great. That's the number one thing we need to think about. All right, so let's talk about that. So where do we go from here? So regulation, inevitable in the US. Agree or not? No, don't agree. I don't think anything is inevitable politically really? in this climate. OK. No. Likely? I hope so. I don't know what else. There's, I mean, there's there's different things going on. I mean, the honest ad, the honest ads bill may may pass, um, yeah. but you know, obviously, everyone knows the U.S. regulatory climate is, is not very functional at the moment. Um, the GDPR is about to go in effect in Europe. If you weren't aware of that, that's coming up in May. Um, that's going to set d data rules that right now the U.S. by comparison is unprotected in terms of privacy. And so I think one thing that's very easy is for, um, and I know Klobuchar and Kennedy and. Um, uh, one other, uh, Blumenthal, are putting a, a bill for that's basically going to be universal data protection for U.S. citizens. Um, hopefully, just mapping to the um, 
the equal protection with Europe. Um, I think we need to examine some much deeper questions, though, uh, around what does it mean to have something so powerful? How do you make it accountable to something other than its own, its own profit? And only because Facebook is affecting 2 billion people's minds. And we haven't gotten any of the issues around, you know, it's a machine that's just trying to throw thoughts in people's minds based on whatever thoughts got clicked and liked the most. And so in languages that the engineers don't even speak, including Sri Lanka, Burma, you basically have uh, genocides being amplified by the fact that these are countries that came online in the last two or three years. You have automated systems pushing thoughts in people's minds, fake news, causing literally people to kill each other. Um, and the UN has actually called out Facebook in the case of Burma as, as basically the, one of the principal, the principal amplifier uh, of, that, of that conflict. And so I say this in the sense of, you know, when the New York Times asked, I think it was nine experts, um, you know, uh, what would you do to fix Facebook? And Tim Wu, who wrote this great book called The Attention Merchants about the attention economy, said, I would turn it into a global public benefit corporation. And it might sound incredibly naive to say something like that, but I don't think anything with, some, with that much power should be anything but that. So there's a question of whether you take the existing system and you get it there, or you constrain the existing system and you make room for new competition. And I think both, both of those are, are important levers to be looking at. I think you know, that, that's a naive way of thinking about the future, that making it a nonprofit or global benefit corporation. I think where we need to be thinking about is not about what happened in the past, which is not the text-based you know, uh, logarithms that they have been able to build, but putting more regulation around you know, facial recognition, visual data they are collecting, the, you know, the video data they are collecting, because the AI can create much more effective fake you know, okay. personas that can have much more damaging impact on society. And I think if that is where, that's the baseline we need to start with. What has happened in the past, probably difficult to monitor right now. So very hard rules around you know, the visual data. Hard rules established by whom? In other words, do we use the same levers that we have traditionally used? Government regulation being one of them, industry self-policing being another, consumers voting with their wallet being a third, potentially, potentially advertisers. Yes. So all of the above. Plus, Chris, whatever Chris suggests. Okay, Chris, what do you suggest? Were you saying plus the data dividend or yeah. something? That one? Else? Yeah. So data yeah. protection agency yeah. or a data dividend? Well, I think both. I think I think we could have a data protection agency modeled off of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Or if you don't like that, if you're on the right, you could choose other regulatory agencies. There, there, there is even in a period when there's a lot of distrust in government. Unfortunately, I think we have to have public policy. That is the role of public policy. Mm -hmm to stand up for citizens, people, consumers uh, who, who need that protection. So it's just not, we live in a time where we just like, whenever we start talking about public policy, everybody goes, oh, we're never gonna get anything done. We shrug. Mm -hmm. And I share that cynicism, but we've got to beat back against it. And I think this is a perfect example of, of a place where, uh, where, where we can make headway. I do wanna just though comment though on the three things that you just, outlined consumers voting with their wallets is not it, it isn't isn't feasible in this moment in the same way that it would be in others i mean you think about competition amongst these platforms given that facebook owns well certainly facebook itself but messenger instagram and whatsapp i mean by some count 80% instagram. of the social facebook instagram whatsapp and facebook messenger some by some count 80% of the social traffic on the web is all going through Facebook servers. So this idea that, oh, delete Facebook is a, is a movement, there, there, there aren't viable other um, alternatives out there. So the idea that consumers can, uh, I can't leave, I, I can't leave, and quite frankly, I don't think it's right to ask me to leave Gmail with all the services that are locked in there. By the way, Google knows a lot more than, about me than, than, than Facebook does. So uh, I, I think that we need to have a more nuanced view of, of what consumer power is here. There are some that are calling for data agents, which would enable people to sort of choose an agent, which would um, sort of like a union almost um, lobby on people's behalf. It seems like another newfangled, perhaps naive idea, but there's some very smart people thinking and thinking about how it might work in companies that are starting with that. So I don't know exactly which direction this is going to take, but we have to change the power Chris, dynamics to change the you, landscape. Why, why is it all the smart, decent people used to work at Facebook and are now on the outside? <laughs> and and, and I, I, mean this, I, I mean this with all due respect, like you, Sean Parker, Roger McNamee, the, yeah. the 20 other people on the outside, and I, look, I, I don't think Jan you're... Coombe now. Uh, Jan Coombe, like, doesn't Mark say, oh, all the good people with the good ideas and the decency left, and now I have people 
writing crazy things on internal message boards and this, you, you know, I Cheryl's still in hiding. I mean, what, what is going on? Did, did you guys not talk to him? Does he not answer your phone think, calls? I mean, well, what's the listen, deal? Well, listen, this is where we might disagree a little bit. I don't think that the leadership over there um, has, um, is motivated by any malice. And I have not seen the side of them that is as brusque or um, But you read Boz's like. message, I mean. Well, there there are there are certainly lots of pockets in the company of 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 people uh, who who have very different views views than I do. So I am not sitting up here to defend them. I do think, though, that um, you know it's 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 easy to say that they're they're all um, uh, just living in a different world. I think they're reading the same news. They're having the same conversations that we're having. But the public pressure is really only just now beginning. I mean, a year ago, Mark Zuckerberg was running for president. And everybody, you know, what was was there was certainly not this tone of of close of of of, of a close um, uh, criticism to the company. So I think that I, I, I think that um, there 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 is a, a again not just at Facebook but across the board at these at these companies that they are very well aware that they're under the microscope now. And I think that's a good thing for them and for for democracy in the long term. They because they've been unaccountable for for, for so long. I think there is a bigger problem which we in, in Silicon Valley no one wants to touch, which is we all have blood on our hands. Every single person Absolutely. in the valley has it's become beholden to this idea of unfettered, endless growth at whatever the cost. It's not that people are bad. The whole incentive structure though is based on growing fast and making a lot of money. Whether you Look at, you know, I mean, you think about it, Uber, which was like just an idea in 2008, seven years later, it's like a $50 billion company. That cannot happen, that kind of growth cannot happen without, you know, taking some shortcuts. YouTube became just massive platform by infringing upon, like, you know, IP and, you know, other issues. So I think there is a lot of that is not just Facebook. I think there is a if there is a cultural moment right mm -hmm. now, I think it is time for Silicon Valley to take a step back and just say, hey, we are chasing growth, we are chasing unfettered growth, but now growth behind every data point, there is a person. And as long as we can internalize that as an industry, we will make better decisions. I do think we will make better decisions. And I think this has to be across the board, not just at Facebook, not just at Google, investors, journalists, entrepreneurs, everybody has to be asking this question, are we doing the right thing? And how are we protecting people's data and privacy and their future? And I think that conversation is not just about Facebook. Yes, Facebook is the most visible format, I mean, visible uh, platform, but there is others, you know? People don't talk about them. Okay, so if there is, we're gonna go to the audience question in a minute. If there is a call to action here, right? If we're gonna take this as a serious moment of cultural rec reckoning, what is the call to action for the business community, for the, you began to outline one for the tech community, which is in essence an, an empathy infusion. Um, so for consumers, for, for business, for tech, for policymakers, call to action. A lot of, a lot of things. Um, I, I will say that public pressure is working. Um, so those of us who've been worried about this for a long time, um, you know, if you asked us a year ago, would a year later you imagine Mark's, I mean, just imagine back to April 2017, just where things were at. Would you ever believe that Mark Zuckerberg would be testifying before Congress and would be talking about regulating social media? We were nowhere near that conversation. And so public pressure, is, as it might seem kind of naive or diluting, it's, it actually does have an impact. And the delete Uber campaign, as an example, just like the delete Facebook campaign, that's not going to actually change the revenue or actually meaningfully drop user numbers. But it does change uh, the culture, especially for the employees. Mm -hmm. I know for a fact there are many employees. I mean, Jan Koum, the founder of WhatsApp, just an hour and a half ago just left uh, Facebook. Uh, and there's many more people sort of in that, in that same thing. Because in this, imagine we don't have any antitrust law and you, you don't have advertisers who are willing to pull out their money because it doesn't matter. The one thing is this company is built on people. And if the people don't feel good about essentially the, you know, the, the practices or the business model, the responses of the company, they're, they're going to leave. And that's exactly what happened, by the way, with Uber and what forced Travis to leave and what created that cultural change at Uber. So there's a model for this. And I'll say that that's working. And I think that there can be a lot more of that. 
I, I can just add one line to that. Just like so, Uber case, the middle management wanted change. At Facebook, middle management wants no change. Jean Coombe left because he was not an employee, like a regular employee. He was on the board. He started a company which sold to Facebook for nineteen billion dollars. He's an exception, not a rule. One person, just one person, publicly quit over Facebook's policies. So there is literally no one thinking there that what they're doing is wrong. Right. Like not like people talk about it. There, no one is leaving their cushy million dollars a year jobs and their club med lifestyle. All right, this is just a fact. <laughs> Like I don't, you haven't been to a club med lately. Yeah. Right. Uh, <laughs> this is the uh, Silicon uh, Valley version. Uh, but you know, I think it all goes back to what Chris was saying. Um, and Chris has been early involved in public service. Um, and you can have apathy about public service, or you can get involved. And you know what? Watching that hearing, they're so old. They're all so very old. And there's nothing wrong with being old. But we can't have every member of Congress, 75 years of age and, and older. Uh, the world changes fast. You need young, you need diversity throughout all organizations and cultures, and, and part of diversity is age diversity. You know, the, wh whichever senator asking Mark Zuckerberg, like, well, if you don't charge subscriptions, how do you make money? And then he has to answer, without offending him, Senator, we, we sell ads, right? That senator was either too confused or couldn't be bothered to, like, read an article, you know? Um, so we need to make regulation. We need to make bad regulation and fix it and make better regulation, but we need to try. And we need to have a political climate in this country where where good people can run for office. I mean, that's, that's really the what solution. you're saying is good people who are tech savvy can run for office. Well, those are the issues but, that are front and center but, right but now. But I think that I, the reason why I go with age diversity is that I think you basically could have put almost any 25 year old in that room, and they probably could have asked more informed questions. But not a, not a person who asked him questions is even on Facebook. Like it, it's scary. Which is why I chose to use tech savvy rather than yeah. No, just, it's, but, that's because I'm older than you. But so no, but also, but I, but I think, but I, I think saying diversity in age is fair too. You know. Um, does this audience have any questions? Because we'd love to open it up to. Yep, we see one over there. So let's get a mic. That the that lady at the very, very end of that row. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so Chris, I love your idea on the data dividend. Um, Thank you. Do you think that? Um, the impetus, what would drive that to actually happen if what John is saying is true, which is that, you know, this is kind of spin and these PNG still need Facebook as much as they always did. I mean, what would drive a platform like that? What would be the impetus for that? If, if these, if, if Facebook is still getting all the dollars and there's, you know, there's all these reasons people should be turning off Facebook and they're just not, and even if they do on the margin, the brands are still going to pay them. Well, I think in the long term you need public policy. In the short term, you could imagine um, creating a cultural norm where the where the companies um, agree to participate in a dividend and say we're we're. I mean, the the numbers though, um, when you start cutting, there it turns out there are a lot of Americans and there are a lot of there's a lot of people using the network. So the numbers don't add up unless you go to not just Facebook and Google, but a broader set of companies and also talk about a meaningful amount of money, something like. Um, you know, three or five percent of uh, royalty on um, on the revenues. Again, the Alaska model though shows that not only is it possible to do that, the royalties up there are several times larger than that, but um, it has really powerful effects because it's that classic kind of win-win that our society is so obsessed with. Because in that in that scenario, the companies are able to continue. Um, innovating, and I think this would have to happen with data privacy and protection in tandem, and consumers get their um, get their 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 cut of it. And I and I think the other thing that is that's critical to mention is that a lot of the you know people talk a lot about income inequality these days and the uh, the growing one the wealth of the one percent. So much of that is because uh, the returns on capital over time have been so pronounced. So this is a way of giving everybody a share. Um, so it's very, it's very feasible to do. You can cut the checks through Social Security. It's not, it's not complex. It's just whether or not we can develop the political right, will to get it, it also, done. It also, though, with that model where it gives us a sort of agency over or at least compensates us for our data, it does not push us to rethink our relationship with this technology. Well, that's why I think it has right? to happen in tandem, right? I, I, I think there's a sense of shared ownership 
of the data is, is piece one, and with that will come better regulation, and also with that should come you know, recognition of the wealth it creates. There's also some stuff, there's, just to answer your question specifically, there's also some stuff happening at the state level. So in California, um, I work and partner with a group called Common Sense Media, which does advocacy around how children with screens are affected by these things. And there's a bunch of stuff moving there. Uh, actually, a ton of progress being made on privacy uh, legislation. And we get emails. I was, we have a lot of contacts with the current Congress, and the staffers for major Congress members email us and say, hey, we see what you're doing in California. Can that serve as a model for us? And so you know, there's, there's actually a group called Tech Con Congress, which is educating Congress members about tech policy, so they don't make it all the way up to the top all the time. So there's just want to give you guys a little bit of hope that there's stuff moving. There's also a bill in California called the BOTS bill. Um, also to uh, Ohm's very correct point that automation and AI pointed at people's brains, whether it's through deep fakes or addiction, is going to be a really serious issue when you have a supercomputer who knows way more how your mind works than you know about how your mind works. Um, protecting that, there's something already in the works right now called the Boss Bill in California. So th there's some progress that if you do it in California, which that is possible, then you can actually get some more momentum. And what about the Boss Bill? Is that something you think that we should get behind? Uh, it's super early, so I think it's going to need serious fleshing out to get it right. I'm looking at you. No? Uh, you don't know. I'm with, I'm you're with him? Yeah. Okay, you're all for it. Okay. Um, let's maybe one, uh, maybe this. Uh, oh, you got a mic. Perfect. Thank you. Hi. Um, part of the uh, problem <clears throat> with this issue is obviously its global nature. Um, you have 270 million Facebook users in India. You have 240 million Facebook users in the US. You have more Facebook users combined in Indonesia and Brazil than you do in the US. Um, so my question for the panel is, what's their perspective on how um, we can tackle this issue and create a social contract in, in nations where they don't have the same democratic traditions and norms as the US and are probably in need of uh, a, a greater focus on this issue than a country like the United States? <laughs> this is what keeps me up, up at night. I was on a panel with someone who's head of policy at Facebook in Europe, and you know, it was about these issues about the West and democracy and fake news. And then one by one, because it, uh, it was an event in, in, in Hungary, and there was all these representatives from the Philippines and Sri Lanka, and it was just like one by one these countries where Facebook was just creating cultural damage, and they were kind of raising their hand meekly saying, like, could you please take a look at the fake news in my country because it's leading to this like thing over here. And then there's the next person, just one after another after another. And I think the problem is, how big of a budget of control are you going to need to deal with those issues? And this is why I say, I think the fundamental thing is we've unleashed Pandora's box. Because there's two billion people that are jacked in. You can't have two billion minds. And think of it like two billion live TVs, right? Uh, there's, there's a reason there's a five second delay on live TV, because we have to watch out. What if someone says something? We want to like, be careful. But there's two billion live TVs. And so I say that because um, the amount of moderation or values or eth ethical discernment or all that kind of processes and conversations you'd have to have, you can't do that in, in all of these different countries, especially when most, they don't, Facebook likely doesn't have engineers who speak the language of many of these countries being impacted. And I think what we need to start establishing is what would that percentage security budget police force be? If it's, you know, 5% per country that they spend, there's some norm, some global norm of the number of staff that they have to allocate in the short term. But in the long term, it's like it's automation. The, these systems are so automated, it's very hard to control. I think the more, more important way to think about this is that how do you graft social and cultural you know, genes into how uh, Facebook has worked? Any product uh, company like Facebook calls it you know, its customers users or its you know, web citizens as users. And, I think that that alone is the biggest problem. Just they should start by referring to them as citizens more than anything else, and then taking the step to having local bodies actually educating, you know, the mothership, like how things work locally. I remember being a reporter in India, and you know, every time I read a story in New York Times about India, and I would just say, "Am I living in the same country, or is it's just like how is this even?" possible and I think that that gap is actually more magnified on social media platforms is that because a lot of it is just viewed from the far it's just like these are the number of users we have in Brazil no this is the number of people we have in Brazil and we have to think about them as people not as a data point and I think that cultural change needs to happen way before anything you know any rules come into play 
I think that's that's the most important thing they can do is establish small, almost like embassies of like un learning and understanding local cultures. That's the number one thing they should do, and that's not a huge cost issue for the company. I mean, that's what I think. Maybe you know other people have better ideas. John, I agree. Uh, Mike, back there. Yep. So. Uh, let me ask the the question about do I, that I'm asking myself: Do I really need this? <clears throat> yeah. And mm -hmm. and the real question, and I invented four millennials, and we're all having this conversation, <laughs> okay? And we're saying, do we really need this? But in the social engineering aspect, are we so socially engineered now that we are not going backwards? It, with that, we're not going to the place where I get a flip phone and don't text anybody. M Mike, Good. I, I think about this a lot, and I think that it's entirely possible that we will turn around five or ten years from now and say that it was just an all big stupid waste of time, and that Facebook was a big stupid waste of time, and Instagram was a big stupid waste of time, and we're just doing totally different things. And we've got better software, so we're not inundated with stupid emails all day. And we spent a lot less time doing this. And you know, there was a great article written in the New York Times where somebody said that, I can't remember if it was in the 1920s or the 1930s, that like heroin dens were unbelievably um, widespread in New York City. And like basically an enormous percentage of the population would, would go into a heroin den and do heroin all night long, basically, right? And I think it's possible that we'll look back on this as just being like, um, just a terrible time in human history where we wasted tons of time staring at our phones. Yeah. Oh, wait, wait, wait. T t <laughs> gentlemen, <laughs> comments? I mean, I, I mean, I think that's unlikely in the short term. However, I do think that, you know, the history of technologies is, um, you know, you start with the printed advertisement and then actually tracing it the, through Tim Wu's book through radio through television and you know more and more time and more and more attention is owned but you don't tend to see everybody stopping using television people still do listen to to radio and social media just gets a added on so i guess i'm a little bit more worried that it's just added on and then the next the next frontier of augmented reality or choose whatever you're most interested in is as that next frontier gets augmented on too so i'm 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 skeptical and i and i do just personally me feel very, very uh, addicted to my device. And I go out of my way to try not to check email every single hour or check Slack, or on the weekend just put the phone away. And if I'm in another room without a phone for more than an hour, I am anxious. And I know it's because I don't, I, I don't have it. And, and I am the type of person I like to think is pretty aware of all of these things and aware of the behavioral effects, and yet I still suffer from it, and I don't know it's for cigarettes. me, press what I mean, to do, let alone for my kid. You it's know? cigarettes. I mean, you know, Ohm used the analogy five times, and people use it more and more before coming on to mm -hmm. this panel. I mean, everything mm -hmm. you said sounds like someone who needs a cigarette. And yeah. you know what? And, and, and I don't even smoke, and I know, and, and I feel I, the same thing. I haven't looked at my phone enough. I mean, it, it, it's so unbelievably addictive. It, a whole nother panel <coughs> is on children. And, and those yeah. of us that have young children, I mean, it's terrifying. But wait, we must be able to like our nicotine habit that millions of Americans have quit, there must be a path, right? You don't mean to sound as defeatist as, as I'm reading it, well, I, I hope. I think it's different than nicotine because it is often socially useful. This is the casino or the slot machine metaphor. Sometimes it, I, I really need to read my email. <laughs> you know, sometimes I really need to know if my, you know, if somebody's sick or tech. So I think right. that that's not quite right, right. because it's but not like sugar a, but or. But there's a path between cold turkey, right? Two billion people. There is, going and I try off. to walk it. But right, but so man. that's progress. Way to go, dude. That's awesome. <laughs> so, but why? Why is that not a path towards a saner existence around around social? Not, not to do any self promotion, but um, so we. Um, <laughs> but I did tee you up. The, the, uh, we started this organization called the Center for Humane Technology with the premise that you have to redesign the entire technology stack from the ground up with a very vulnerable and manipulable model of a human being. So sort of take a magician's view of the human mind. How do we get manipulated at every single level by a phone? It's not just that it's addictive in some generic way. It's that the addictive stuff is right next to the stuff I have to do. I have to know if I'm late for that meeting and check my email. But then right there, when I switch the app switcher, there's Facebook, and I'm getting the dings, and I'm getting social approval. And so I'm going to go back and switch. And so you have to think of this 
as like a badly designed urban plan. Yeah. So you, you wake up one day and after you know, 20 years of no building codes and zoning laws, suddenly you're inside of this, this like casino filled environment. And it's like crazy and everyone's insane and no one believes anything that's true and there's like lights everywhere and everyone's addicted to slot machines. And that's like the city that you enter into when you look at your phone. The answer isn't like throw away the city, right? The answer is like let's have Jane Jacobs in the livable cities movement of the 1950s and 60s uh, where you ask like what makes a city livable for people? And you can ask that question, that's hum a humane way to not just design it but also have business models that are not extractive based on manipulation and also humane policy. But you need to think about it from the ground up. And that's why we, you know, the simplest thing, by the way, if you um, we recommend turning your phone, first of all, taking all your notifications off your phone because having it buzz against your skin is a huge problem. Second thing is setting your phone to grayscale because looking at even just at the color of your screen activates kind of like banana-like rewards for the chimp inside you. And if you just turn that off, if you turn this off, if you just set your phone to grayscale, it actually makes a really big difference. And I, those are just two small things. Thank you. And unfortunately, I'm being told that we have to, um, to wrap. So thank you thank all you. very much. We'll see you next year. Thank you.